The colours here are actually just a measure of the intensity. Uh, they're not really the colours of space at all. They're a way of us representing slightly cooler and slightly hotter spots in the universe. But when I say slightly, I mean a few millionths of a degree hotter or colder. So, as you saw in Lichia's image... So why was it necessary to differentiate them if it, the gap is so very small? Well, well, because what are you trying to... As, as, as Jean-Michel explained, these, these are the structures that then make... Uh, the way the universe is today because it's these lumps and bumps which are the locations where galaxies and galaxy clusters formed which we see today. So that's the structure we were after and we had to crank the contrast up to see it. That, uh, can I ask you a kind of journalistic, I'm not a scientist guys which you probably guessed, um, can I ask you a journalistic question which is I look at that and think oh wow, what, what do you think Jean-Michel when you look at something like that? Uh, I, I'm amazed. <laughs> I'm absolutely amazed of two things. First, because it's really for a physicist, it's really beautiful. You cannot imagine to build a black body in, lab, in the lab that is as perfect as a black body we see in the sky. And the other thing that I find amazing is that we were able after years of uh, errors and misunderstandings, we are able to understand most of it now. And that's, uh, I, I just, I have to sit down if I want to. <laughs> very soon, very soon, John michel A question at the back. Can we get, a, get a, um, the mic over there? I think we mustn't let the Indians monopolize these questions, by yeah, the way. I'm sorry, yes? I promise, this is my last question. But it's very intriguing what you say. You now say you understand everything. What I would like to know is that every time we see a representation of the, the a hypothetical form of the universe, it's always in the form of a rugby ball. It seems to be accepted that it's, uh, the universe even today is expanding at a constantly accelerating pace. Do we know how, how, much, how sure are we that it actually looks like this oval and not another form like a perfectly round uh, <coughs> circle, for example, or like nothing at all? Is it, why is it, are we, why sure are we showing it in this elliptical fashion? Yeah. Uh, is it yeah. a convention uh, or what, yeah. Mark? Uh, ah, the, the ellipse, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's called a, a Molvide projection. You know, it's the universe, you see it as a sphere, and you want to project it uh, uh, on a plane, which is uh, this screen. And this is a very well-known problem, and there is no good solution for that. We have uh, 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 taken one of the solutions, and we put the galaxy at the center, and that's it. It's, it's, it's just like the way a map works. And, you know, you can't represent the Earth as a globe without having a globe. If you want it in a book, you have to flatten it out. And you can make a square map, a Mercator projection, or you can use a Molvider, which is this oval, and that, that doesn't distort the shape so much. So that has nothing to do with the expansion of the universe. I think there's a bit of it. That's something separate. That mm -hmm. shape is... So that's just the convention that you're using? It's just it's a way just of okay. projecting the whole thing. Uh, can we have a social media question? Do we have anything on Twitter? Uh, um, so we've had uh, a few more questions in on the uh, Origins Night hashtag. Um, I don't think we're going to be able to get through all of them, but we'll, uh, we'll give it a bash. Um, Go for the sexiest ones. So, well, we've had one that I'm quite interested in, actually, um, from Katya. Um, it's, the question is, we've explained a little bit about hydrogen and helium, but what about all the other elements? Where do they come from? Um, and yeah, does, does Planck have any say about that? Yeah, yeah, that, that, that's actually much more complicated here. So most, most of the science that we do here doesn't deal with uh, the other elements almost at all. I mean, we do have some cross-section. But most of, the, most of the higher order elements are either we think they're made in stars or after most of the stuff that we've talked about here. If, if I may, it happens much earlier in the history of the universe than the last scattering uh, uh, diffusion. And that's people working on this question, how uh, mole uh, he molecules uh, heavier than helium form, that these people who, who has made the prediction that we should observe that one day. I have a question before I let you guys go and let you sit down, Jean-Michel, which you're <laughs> desperate to do. Um, this amazing image, what comes next? Because there's a lot of buzz that there's some good stuff that you're going to be releasing sometime in the next few months, years, yeah? Well, as, as Renault pointed out from Darmstadt a little bit earlier, these guys have analysed about 18 months of the data which have been taken so far, but we've got several years' worth beyond that. And the real key thing is to dig and scrape under this signal and try to actually look at the directionality of the light. Not only is the light intense and bright, 
but it's polarized. Ah. And right at the very bottom of the signal here, scraping away and looking, that's why it's taking so long to do, they're looking for the polarization signal. And if we can get that, we can actually look behind this and look right back in the first tiniest fraction of the age of the universe and see the period called inflation. Okay. And that's a, that's a huge goal for these, these scientists. And you're going to have to come back and tell us all about it in a next, year or two. Next year. Next year. <laughs> Mark, Ken and Jean-Michel, thank you so very much. Thank you. Time to talk about the Higgs. Did you, interest, did you enjoy the stuff about Planck, by the way? Did you learn quite a lot? Because I surely did. Well, in order to talk about the Higgs, I am actually going to talk to you not first to a particle physicist. I'm going to introduce you to a cosmologist. This is interesting. Ben Van Delt is here somewhere. Where are you, Ben? Come on up. Hi, Nima. What is the interest of a cosmologist in particle physics, in the LHC, what's going on over here? Is it relevant at all to the kind of questions you're grappling with? I think we're all asking the same sorts of questions. We're, um, we have these very modest questions like how did the universe begin? What's the geometry of the universe? What is everything in it? Um, how did it start? Uh, what's the, uh, what are the symmetries in the universe? What's dark matter? What's dark energy? Those are, uh, you know, actually pretty immodest question if you think about questions if you think about it and we're going at it from different in different directions as uh, cosmologists using astronomical observations like Planck um, we use light as a time machine to go back to the beginning of the universe and observe it directly um, and this is maybe a unfamiliar concept but you can't really can't help but look into the past so looking into the past is something you do every day. You see me just slightly in the past right now because light takes some time to travel to your eyes. And so this fantastic way um, in which you know, you've seen this movie, this light particle that travels all the way, in fact, uh, allows us to look back um, right it, isn't the there a problem, though, that you cosmologists face? And that is that you can only go so far as when the light was released or trapped or I mean we're using rather human words for it no, but whatever, it's, it's whatever it's exactly that was going that. on there. Um, so yes the light was released that we see in the cosmic microwave background with Planck was released at 380,000 years after the Big Bang so you could say that's quite a long time but it turns out there is something um, a little bit poetic about uh, about this which is that in this case small um, is really is beautiful because these tiny little perturbations uh, mean that, we, that our mathematical tools for going back and calculating what happened in the very beginning work extremely well. We can use you know, existing tools to really go back to almost t equals zero. And uh, because in this way, what the image that you see in Planck is an image of the vacuum fluctuations um, you know, in the very earliest moments uh, where space and time themselves were fluctuating qu quantum mechanically. So you're seeing a... I mean, you know, what does this image mean? Well, a shiver should, you know, when I think about it, I, I get, uh, you know, hairs raise up. And uh, because, you know, you see uh, the first hint of quantum gravity that we can see with our own, you know, that we can directly see. So, so in what, that, what, that sense, it's very... So then can I ask you, is there any relevance to your work and the work of cosmologists in, in terms of the, the, the discovery of the Higgs boson? Is that just really a particle physicist obsession or uh, something that matters not. to all so of we're, us? We're going at it as cosmologists with Planck, we're going at it in a fairly global fashion. We're trying to, you know, we're making this image. Um, but then we also try to want to actually know what the laws, what the fundamental laws are and want to go into the details. How do particles interact at the highest energies that are relevant for the very, very earliest times. And so in this way, you can think of LHC and um, also a little bit like a time machine, except that you're, um, you, you're just trying to recreate the conditions of the early universe and study what happens when particles interact under these extremely high energies. But, but how, how certain can you be that these particle collisions, the protons being fired at each other down in the, in the LHC, really have anything to do with the early universe? I mean, isn't that just a big leap of faith? 
Well, so far, every time we've been able to um, take physics that we learned about in the lab on Earth, uh, we found it in the universe. And in, in, in lots of astrophysical systems, we see extremely, um, we see extreme conditions where uh, we've, you know, we, we push particle, particle physics to its limits, and we find correspondences to what happens uh, in accelerators. And so, it, yes, it's true that with, um, with just, you know, with the particle accelerator as big as the Earth, uh, you could still not get back quite to that very first beginning, but uh, the goal is to really understand particle physics at, it, uh, at the foundations. And one of the um, amazing discoveries, one of the amazing things about the Higgs discovery was that for the first time, uh, we see it, saw a manifestation of something that we call a scalar field, which has been inspiring a lot of our thinking about the very, very early universe, about the epoch of inflation. Uh, which created all these, um, all these perturbations that you see in this map. And more on that in a minute or two. Ben, thank you so very much for joining us. So has he kind of um, got your excitement, has he got your curiosity excited? If a cosmologist is interested in proton collisions, maybe we should all. Who is that over there? Down below, 100 meters down, we have Frederic Baudry. Hi, Frederic. Hi. Understand. How are you? <laughs> Let me introduce you to our audience over here. Frederic is the department leader for accelerators here at CERN. Um, and we're going to quiz you about what's going on down there, that great big machine. But I have the mic, so I'm going to ask you the first question, and that is, is it entirely safe for you to be there at this moment in time? Fully safe. No problem at all. I, for, for the long shutdown, now we remove all the helium in the machine. We have no more powering, then the, the situation is completely safe. And it's open day tomorrow, so I sincerely hope you're right. Definitely, don't <laughs> worry. <laughs> all is under control. And it, you're not running collisions at the moment, are you? Let's have a question for Frédéric Baudry. Who would like to know about anything they want, about the workings of the LHC, the working of the accelerator? Any, we can find out more about the experiments a bit later. Anyone want the mic? Okay. Hello. Uh, something that I, I, I really... Stand up, stand up, so okay. we can all see you. I, I really did not understand. How do you succeed to accelerate something that is invisible? like elementary particles. Ah, oh. how do ah. you accelerate something that is invisible, like an elementary particle? How do you accelerate it, ah, Frédéric? Good, good point. Uh, uh, the acceleration is uh, creating an uh, electric, electrical field, and a particle, in spite of invisible, is traveling in this uh, electrical field and getting acceleration thanks to this electrical field. Is it, is it clear enough? It's just electrical field. And how difficult is it to do that? Because you've been put to giving them more and more energy, haven't you? Yeah, sure, sure. I think we have in LHC one point, it's a point four. We are not in the point four, we are in point one, where we have good, uh, radio frequencies that every time a particle, a bunch of particles is passing, we are giving a kick, an acceleration. I, imagine a swing. You are every time giving a, a little more of, of energy and so on. Then the particle is going through the machine with the speed of the light. Every 88 microseconds is passing in point four, where you have a system, a radio frequency, and you are giving a small kick. Let's get the mic to the back over there. There's a hand sticking up, please. Sorry? Thank you. I'm just, di ah, di okay. I'm just directing the mic to the next question for you, Frederic. Okay. Okay. What would you like to ask? Sorry. So you accelerate the particles using, using the electromagnetic field. Electrical field. No. Electrical field. Mm -hmm. So then for particles that have no charge, is there no way to accelerate them? For example, like a neutron or something like that. Sorry, difficult to, it's noisy in this, in this <laughs> tunnel, it's difficult for, to hear. For particles with no charge, how would you accelerate them? Would it work just the same? Ah, but we are not accelerating particles with no charge. We are accelerating in energy proton or lead with charge. It's, we are not accelerating, we need to have an acceleration, and it's not, not only the acceleration, you can see the magnet where I'm close, you have to, after that, to guide the, the particles. And to guide the particles all around the LHC, you need to create a magnetic field. Then a, a, a particle going through this magnetic field is having a force, and you can keep the particles over the circumference, or to focus the beam thanks to the magnetic field, but you need a charge. 
Then we have accelerator where we have proton or antiproton, electron or anti-electron, or lead, charged lead uh, atom. But we, 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 need to, we, can't, we can't with neutral, neutral particles. I, I take it those are those big magnets, right? That, that big thing behind you? Could you hear me? Yes. What is the role of those big magnets? Is that, is that one of the big dipole magnets behind you? This, by the way, is a quadrupole. Oh, okay. It's a quadrupole. Okay. Yeah, we, have, we can see just behind is a dipole. The role of the dipole is to maintain the, the beam on the circumference, just to create a force to, to keep that. And a quadrupole, because it's not only one proton, you have a bunch of particles. So to say, uh, uh, one bunch in LHC is 10 to 11, 100 billion of particles, and all with the same charge. Then they have the tendency to explode the bunch, and we need to focus them, and the quadrupole is the magnet to focus the things. And what we need to, to do, what it is uh, in front of me after that, is a big detector. When we want to collide this bunch of particles, we have to have a very small cross-section. And to get this very uh, small cross-section, we need very high uh, power, uh, high focus with the quadrupole to diminish this uh, cross-section. You have to imagine the bunches are 15 micrometer when they are going in collision. Okay, thank you very much. Another question? Anyone want to put another question? Let's hear someone right in front of me. Please stand up. What changes are you making in the next few years? What, what kind of changes are you going to be making? I mean, they shut down at the moment, right? So how oh. will it be different when you reopen? Okay. Now we run uh, the last three years uh, the LHC at half of the nominal energy. We run uh, initially at 3.5 TV and 4 TV. We run almost during three years. Now during the long shutdown, what you have to do is first of all the maintenance of all the equipment. We have a lot of equipment as uh, all the cryogenic system to maintain, but a lot of system. But also what we are doing, um, just in front of that, is what we call interconnection. It's interconnection between two magnets. And we have to consolidate this interconnection to uh, double, more or less, to double the current through this interconnection. That is to say also to double the energy of the LHC. Then instead to run as we did last year at 4 TV, we will restart at 6.5 TV. And we hope after that to go slowly towards 7 TV. Then this is the main work we have to do. But it's not only the work to consolidate the machine, it's also the maintenance. Frédéric Vaudry, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a great pleasure. It was a pleasure for me. <laughs> and apologies to the cluster of hands that went over there that we didn't get to you, but we, I've got a really cool person to introduce you to next. John Judice, where is he? John Judice is a, you know, right at the top of the, the physical pe pe physicist specking order. He's a theoretical physicist. I bow down before you, John. I'm going to ask you the most difficult question of the night. Can you please tell me what the Higgs boson is, so that I understand? Well, the Higgs boson is a triumph of uh, human intellect. It's a triumph of a uh, generation of uh, theoretical physicists who in the 60s and the 70s understood the role, the fundamental role of symmetries in nature. And from there, using pure deduction, they uh, understood, they predicted the existence of new particles, such as the Z, the W, and the Higgs boson, and one by one, these particles were discovered. It was a triumph of experimental physics, because the LHC is the largest and most complex uh, scientific project ever uh, attempted by humanity, and thousands of thousands of physicists, engineers, technicians, worked to solve some of the most incredible challenge in the, from the technological point of view. But it's also a triumph of our understanding of the connection between the microscopic world of particle physics and the large-scale structure of the universe. But what is the connection between the Higgs, this elusive, tiny little thing, and, and the universe? So let me show you some images also to do this. So Ben was talking to us about it earlier. I want a theoretical physicist's perspective on this. So, the, um, for, for me, 
uh, this uh, connection between the microscopic world and the large-scale structure of the universe, really one of the most astounding results of modern science. And as we said, the Higgs is, is a beautiful example of this connection. I was just waving my hand, but please go back one transparency. See, we agree that when I was waving the hand, it should change the slide. <laughs> this is high technology. I wave a hand, somebody push the button. But not always sophisticated technology works. Um, but uh, uh, as I was saying, uh, it, to, to, want to see this connection, in the case of the Higgs boson, what you have to understand is that particle physics is not really about particles. When we go to scales where quantum mechanics rules the, the world, we understand that uh, the fundamental elements that enter the equations that describe the fundamental laws of nature are not particles, but are fields. Only one question. <laughs> um, well, we're familiar with, with fields even classical, classical physics. Take the electric field, as mentioned before. Take the gravitational field that communicates the pull, the gravitational pull of the sun to the faraway planets. Well, when we go to very small distances, uh, where, and we use the laws of uh, uh, quantum mechanics and relativity, we discover that these fields are not uh, just a uniform thing, but are made of individual entities, are made of uh, some uh, uh, quantized and localized lumps of energies. And this, these lumps of energy is what we call particles. But the fundamental ele element that the entity that enters uh, the equation that's unique is the field. So there is an electron field that describes all, every electron there is in the universe with only one uh, mathematical quantity. Well, we discovered the Higgs boson. You may say, well, that's a big deal. You discover a new particle, so probably there's a, there's a field associated with that. But well, what's a big deal? There is a big deal because there is an important difference. In the case of all the fields that we know, when you don't have these particle excitations, the average value of the field is zero. I talk about average value because there are always quantum fluctuations. But this is not a very surprising result, right? If there are no particles, no radiation, well, the field is zero. But that's not the case for the Higgs field. In the, well, it was supposed to be, there is a problem with the slide. No, uh, no, let's see. Let's see if we can get the, the, the Higgs, Higgs field The field instead has a uniform distribution, an average value, which is different than zero. Now you see then the connection with the universe because you understand that this uh, uh, uniform distribution which, by the way, was generating the universe at a fraction of a billionth of a second after the Big Bang, this distribution changes the global properties of space-time, and therefore it will affect the, uh, the properties of the universe. Uh, what does it do in the universe? Well, the, the first fact is that it damps uh, weak interaction, the weak force. It cannot propagate over large distances, but can, can uh, it's... Uh, uh, action is reduced only to distances which are about 100 times smaller than the atomic nucleus. And that's why in our ordinary life, we feel the fact of gravity, we feel the fact of electromagnetism, but you're not used to the weak force. The weak force is only a very tiny distances. And it also sets the scale for the formation of, of atoms. It sets the scale of an atom. That's what the Higgs field does. I talk about the scale, the size of an atom rather than the mass, because as you probably know, most of the mass of an atom is actually coming from the binding energy, the internal binding energy of the nuclei. If you didn't understand, let me repeat it in plain words. Uh, uh, the Stalinist Communist Party controls the masses, not the Higgs field. Um, I'm going to stop you there. I'm going to let, let the audience ask you some questions. Come on, let's have, who wants this mic? Yes, are you complete? Oh, yes, they're right in the corner. Go for it. Could you explain how the Higgs boson is connected to gravity and what it means for dark energy or dark uh, matter having found the Higgs boson now? Okay, I was there, He's got you onto this slide, hasn't he? Well, not really. <laughs> so uh, it is uh, not directly connected to, uh, to gravity, for, for, all, for all we know. Um, at the moment, uh, we still... Uh, don't understand how to put in the scheme of uh, quantum theory uh, uh, gravity completely. 
And the Higgs, the Higgs field is really something relevant for, the, for another kind of force, a force that you're less familiar, which is uh, uh, the, the, the weak force. Uh, then, since you mentioned that it will be a connection with, uh, with that energy in this sense, we have uh, we've understood the role of these, uh, of these fields that feel space-time, right? I mean, the discovery of the Higgs boson was the discovery of this uniform field. The, and, and this field uh, defines the properties of empty space, of nothing. So you can say that now that we've discovered the Higgs boson, we can proudly say we know nothing. Okay? <laughs> and, that's, uh, and that's true, but th that there is a lot to learn about that nothing. And what we have learned that these kind of fields, like the Higgs field, can play a role in the universe, which could be very different. And one of the possibility is that, uh, uh, that uh, it is re some other field is related to dark energy. Why do I say this? Because we know that there is dark energy in the universe, but, and we know the properties, and we know there's no uh, uh, ordinary fluid that can describe those properties. On the other hand, a field that has an average value uh, in space-time has exactly the right properties to describe uh, dark energy. John, uh, where is the particle associated with that? We don't, still don't know. I'm going to say a big thank you. Thank you very much. And you're going to see him at the end of the show. And all his fabulous performance energy. I want to introduce you to the two leaders or the spokespeople for the two big experiments that found the Higgs boson. Come on up, Fabiola Gianotti, who is, was the spokesperson for the Atlas experiment, and Joe in Candela. I can't see where you are. Here you are. Hello, Fabiola. I love you too. I love you too. <laughs> Many congratulations to you, of course. Um, what was it like to make that announcement, whenever it was, just over a year ago? Ah, it was a, it was a big emotion. Well, it was a mixture of emotion and tiredness because we have every, everyone had been working so much over the last months. Of course, we have been working for 25 years to uh, to build the, the these detectors, the machine, and uh, the accelerator. So, of course, there was you know an accumulation of tiredness of 25, 30 years of work. But in particular, the last Last week, sure, right? From beginning of June to the, to the announcement. From the last month was. The last month was really, really something, something, yeah, you know, yeah. working days and nights. Well, what, so, what were you doing working days? Were you absolutely making certain that you were right? Or well, I mean, analyzing the data. Until the last minute? Analyzing the data. We, was, uh, I mean, that's right. the accelerator was giving us data. That's right. We had data coming up till the 18th of June. And then we uh, spent a lot of time inside the collaborations. You know, everyone has to be certain that we've got the right answer. And they made the announcement Everyone's on the 4th of agreed. July, ladies yeah, and gentlemen. Yeah, we made the announcement on the 4th of July. So it was a very short time. Fabio and I were in communication starting around the 22nd of June or something like this. Yes. And then uh, we were... So can I just stop you there? Mm -hmm. they, they were running rival experiments, uh -huh. right? And you weren't allowed to talk to each other for a very long time. So when did you start to talk to each other? Well, say it's well we've talked to each other for many years. We just, <laughs> well, it's I mean, just what do we talk about? We will not disclose this. this, uh, this. Okay. We're all no, friends. It's, okay. uh, it's, uh, we are all friends, first <clears> of all. <throat> Second, we are in competition, yes, but it's a healthy competition. I think that if two experiments had not been there and in competition, the results would have come much, much later. Ah. It's very important because it's a cross, uh, cross encouragement and... Of course, the, the Atlas young guys want to do better than, they, uh, mm -hmm. than their uh, friends in CMS. And of course, when we take data, we want to have a bit, bit more efficiency than, than CMS and vice versa. So it was really, very, very good an, an encouragement. But of course, uh, the discovery has been made by both experiments, and we are working together. So Joe and myself were in, in contact. Mm -hmm. But in a way such that, of course, we don't want to bias to influence each other. Okay, I don't want to tell him we have a signal here because then, you know. <laughs> and so, uh, and so we, have, we were discussing, but... You know, so I want to ask you this question. Mm. You know, um, the discovery, or not the discovery, the scaling of Mount Everest for the first time. Okay, so the official line is that uh, um, Sharpa Tenzing mm -hmm. got to the top at the same time as Edmund Hillary. Right? Uh, who knows? Oh, no. mm -hmm. In India, they say that Sharpa Tenzing got first, and then he waited for Edmund Hillary to get out. You know what I'm going to ask you, that. right? Yes. <laughs> we got yeah, there first. Did you really get that together simultaneously? 
together, simultaneous. It was simultaneous, it really was. Together. And uh, it's because it doesn't happen at an instant, okay? Yes. It's, it, as Fabulous said, it was a 25-year program. It would be very hard, I think, to imagine that two weeks even would have mattered if one was two weeks sooner than the other. There are so many factors that come into play. But what was really impressive, actually, was that we did actually have very comparable results at exactly the same time. And uh, it was within a few weeks we knew what we had. We did not communicate that to the collaborations, of course, but uh, we had met with Rolf and discussed, and, and discussed what to do. Because That's we had the to DG understand. of Sun. That's Rolf, the DG. Yes. And we had to decide what to do. How do we take this public? Yes. Are we ready? And Fabio and I were very nervous about this because it was so fresh and it was so important. So we were, it was very stressful to the very end, but I would say walking into that uh, auditorium, I was certain we, we were okay, and we really had it. You were certain at that point? Yeah. Yes. Let's have some questions. Ten Jones minutes before, Kandera. I wasn't so sure, but... Uh, <laughs> <I> was, <laughs> no. Let's have a question from there. Can we get the mic over? Maybe I'll get it to you quicker. Great, thank you. I would have a million questions, but I will try to restrict it to two. The first one is slightly jaded. Uh, who do you expect to win the next Nobel Prize for Physics? You know, coming oh, up. Oh, physics. Uh, yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> not for literature. A piece. Yeah, it's really a question for the committee. We're hoping. We have some hopes. Yeah, you know, but uh, I think it's a difficult. That would be a difficult one to call, in detail. Good diplomatic answer, mm -hmm. yes. Did you have another question? And, uh, another one is, uh, what's next for you? So what would be the next big announcement for you? Well, before announcing something, we have to, of course, to find it. So, uh, mm. of course, so, no, you know. You haven't found it? <laughs> well, by the between you and me. You know. <laughs> a very good double act, huh? Anyway, so, so first of all, we have a new, a new particle, a new object, a new friend. And we want to understand it in all details. So, of course, we have made a lot of progress since the 4th of July. Mm -hmm. We have established that this particle is the, the type of the X boson. We don't know yet if it is the X boson of the minimal standard model theory, so we'll continue to measure it. But, uh, but the LHC has been conceived and built to address many other questions. The nature of dark matter in the universe, the asymmetry between matter and antimatter, if the forces unify a high energy. So we have been pursuing and actually addressing this question in parallel with the X discovery over the years and we'll continue in the next in the years to That's come. Right. The other thing I would say is that it, we, we actually move fairly slowly in this field. It takes a long time to do many of the things we do. So it was a long search for the Higgs. The, the prior big discoveries, you know, were spaced out over a long period of time. We have a long period of study ahead of us. And so we, at least for the Higgs, it'll take us a long time to really understand its, its properties in detail. So you personally have been at the sort of front seat of a couple of big discoveries, I understand, Joe. I was, I was close to the, uh, involved in the, in the top quark discovery as well. And that was a long time ago. The top so quark? The top quark. It's okay. the last of the, it's the most heavy of all particles that we know. And we did that, at, we had that discovery at the Tevatron. By the way, can I remind people that, uh, that the quarks and leptons have been discovered in the US and uh, bosons, so WZ and Higgs, this particle we spin one or zero in, in Europe? Yeah. <laughs> you may indeed, Fabiola, you may indeed. Another question. Have we got one on Twitter? Yes, uh, the people out on Twitter on the, uh, on the hashtag Origins Night are getting very excited. Um, now, we've had a, a, couple, a, couple of, a pair of questions, and you mentioned how um, the search for the Higgs has been a long process. And we have um, someone who's going by the, the handle of CS Milano, so maybe they're in Italy. Um, they want to know whether the scientists of the past, around the time of Einstein, would be able to understand our discoveries from nowadays. And also, can you imagine uh, what science will look like in the year 2100? And, and where does this all fit in, in mm. the history of, of physics and, uh, and the future of physics? That's good. That's a simple question. <laughs> yes. yeah, so where do you actually I, start I think, with this? I think the, the, the sci for the older, for the scientists at the time of, uh, of uh, Einstein, if you go back to like 1905 and the, really the big years of Einstein, I think, I think they would understand, but it would take them some time because a lot happened between then and now. Quantum mechanics really got developed, gauge field theories, things like this. 
They would be smart enough to probably get it, but we'd have to spend a few years talking to them. Yes. What happens in 2100? I'll let Fabiola tell you. <laughs> so thank you for, uh, for, for leaving all, all the, the most difficult questions to me. So um, <laughs> concerning the, the, well, you know, the question, the answer is we don't know. We are researchers. So uh, one of the most uh, sexy things in research is that you, you, you don't know what they're going to find, otherwise it will not be a research. Okay, so it's, it's very nice that you know, we are in front of surprises and we have some ideas of what we may find next, but our ideas can be completely wrong and nature may have taken another path. So. But you say you don't know what you're going to find, but you wouldn't spend all this money building this huge LHC, and et cetera, unless you were pretty certain you were going the to find it. The money has been spent to address the questions. What I'm saying is that we don't know if the answer to the question is what we have in mind or something else, because nature is more clever than us. Okay, okay. And I've heard the answer that you would have been happy with anything. Well done. Another question at the back. Uh, for, the, for both, I'd like to know personally what do you prefer? One hick or a family of hicks? We, of course, uh, you know, I'm a family man. My thoughts, so. Unanimous answer. Yes. Family, of course. More particles means physics beyond the sun and water means... Well, you know what? I'm going to introduce you to a family of researchers now because you guys didn't, they didn't do it on their own. You know, I know we've had a lot of glory, but let's share some of the glory. There were 3,000 on each of your teams. That's kind of hard to get your head around. Uh, and I think some of the 3,000 are here in this building. Yes. Come on, come on on, wherever you are, researchers. In our audience? Okay, come on up. Big round of applause. Don't be shy wherever. Oh my gosh, you're in the corner. Come on up. Nice to you. Be careful, whatever that is. Make the stage your own. Sit down if you want. Okay, sit down if you like, okay? Make yourself comfortable. This is your space, this is your moment. What questions are we going to put to these many researchers who worked together? H how many names were there on the announcement? Were there 6,000 names and 6,000 Not signatures? quite, I think it was uh, about 5,000. About 5,000, oh, okay. Total, yeah. Oh, I'm kind of getting close. there. Close, you were close. Shall we have a question from the audience? Yes. Could you pass this mic down, please? Thank you. Um, what words of encouragement would you have for 16-year-olds like my daughter who are taking science IGCSEs in a few months? Anyone? Great <laughs> question. And my 15-year-old daughter. So do you expect each one of these people to give an answer? Or? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, who wants to answer it? Yeah, take, you, know, you guys have the mic. Go for it. Well, uh, bring her to CERN. <laughs> yes, they're coming tomorrow, I think, yes. Yeah. But how do you, you know, it, the, I think behind the question is it's hard stuff, isn't it, what you do? I think it, science it can be hard. It stuff. may be hard, but if she likes that, it will not be hard. He should do that. If yeah. The, the mo first motivation is the passion for, for, such, a, for sure. such a work. So if she wants to do that, please let, him, let yeah. she her doing, doing. My college advisor told me not to learn French and not to study physics. <laughs> I, I disagreed in the... Uh, we have a question at the back. Hello. Um, how did you, within the two uh, groups, uh, coordinate the work? I mean, did you have monthly meetings? Did you have websites? Because if 3,000 people work on a project, how does knowledge that one researcher has get transferred to the rest of the team? How did the logistics work? Good question. We have constant meeting, and the meetings are really, you know, happening every week and sometimes twice a day, depending on the activity of uh, of, uh, of the time. Even on Sunday, and Sunday. Even on Saturday and Sunday, and uh, everybody is connected through the web, uh, so we are in constant communication. Yes, somebody somebody once said CMS stands for Continuous Meeting Society. Uh, <laughs> But I think Atlas is similar. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's why you invented the World Wide Web as well, huh? Yeah. Do we have time for another question, or are we going to go to Bologna, Paola? Paola is our great chief, who you can't see at those sitting in the back and pull, pulling the strings. Okay. Yeah. One more question, and yeah. then we're going to go to Excuse Bologna. Me. I probably got it wrong, but in the beginning, I was led to believe that uh, 
you guys were actually in competition, which was very healthy. And now you say you were constant meeting society. Explain. <laughs> you want to say? No, no, no. It's, we've seen that experiment. Uh, we, we communicated within our own experiments, not across the experiments. So let's hope, get this clear. Think, you weren't allowed to talk to the other team, right? No, no, no. Within a but team. I right? think that, uh, um, okay, maybe it will be interesting, but uh, in Seren there is a lot of uh, couples, uh, for example, exactly. husband work at Atlas and wife at oh. CMS and vice versa. And people make their career and, uh, okay, they hidden something from each other, but uh, <laughs> this is only the truth. Very, very interesting pillow I, I can add that people would divorce, divorce rather than betray their experiment. <laughs> sure. We don't want to push you that far. <laughs> Look at that. Really true. I've got some news to, to announce. We're going to, go, we're going to go to Bologna. We're going to join um, another one of these evenings, Meet the Researcher Evenings. Hello. Are you listening to us? No, they're in their own conversation. Who have we got in that picture over there? I don't think they're ready for us yet, Paola. Shall we continue our own conversation? We're going to wait for them. Well, I tell you what, don't you see that they've spent the money on the set? What a beautiful set they've got over there. What we've done is we've brought you the people. What do you reckon? Is this a good, good, good balance of resources? <laughs> I think they're going to join us now. <laughs> hey, Simone, can you hear us? Yeah, how are you? Hi, Bologna. Can we be part of your conversation, please? I've been, we've been hearing over here how the Atlas and CMS teams have been working, huge numbers of people, 3,000 on each team to find the Higgs boson. Now I understand, Professor Zoccoli, that you were uh, running the Italian groups across the LHC, working, working with these teams. Can you tell us a little bit about how many Italians have been here at the LHC? Lots of numbers for you. Yes, thank you very much for the question. Hi, everybody. Yes, uh, Italian contribution to LHC has been uh, really huge. Among the more than 6,000 uh, people of uh, researchers which are participating to the Atlas and CMS uh, experiment, more than 500 are coming from Italy. And most uh, a lot of them are students, I mean PhD or postdoc students, which are also passing a lot of time in CERN, enjoying the CERN life and participating to these really exciting studies at CERN in Geneva. Okay. okay, there seems to be something about physics and Italians, I think. You know, does it in the water or something? I don't know, the schooling. Do you have any questions to ask? Um, our many collaborators over here, we have, a whole, we have a whole stage full of people who'd like to talk to you. And we have Fabiola Gianotti, the spokesperson for the, for the Antonio, Atlas. Antonio, ciao. Yes, uh, I... Uh, in English. Okay, you can do a bit of Italian also if you want. Okay. Lei spesso ha ricordato nelle interviste di come 
eh, da ragazza la studentessa fosse molto interessata anche alle materie umanistiche, alla filosofia, eh, anche se poi è arrivata alle scienze dure e alla fisica. E molti si chiedono se in realtà nel suo lavoro attuale, in questa ricerca sul bosone di Linz, abbia ritrovato anche alcune delle curiosità, delle ispirazioni e, eh, filosofiche che la amavano quando era più giovane. Insomma, c'è della filosofia anche della ricerca sul bosone di Linz. Okay, thanks for the question. I tried to, uh, to Are you going to translate it yes, for us? Yes, Something absolutely. about philosophy. You are right, exactly. So the question is, uh, was alluding to the fact that in my previous studies, before college, I was studying humanities, not humanities, music, and all these things, which uh, in some sense apparently have nothing to do with physics. And what but the question also said was that in, in Italy, she's a rock star. They keep reading no, about her. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's too modest to say that. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so I think the fundamental, one of the fundamental engines for mankind, whatever you do, physics, philosophy, philosophy uh, literature, etc., is curiosity. Curiosity and passion. So there was a question before. I, I think what is very important is to be really uh, pushed by what, we, what we, we love, our dreams. And of course, you know, finding the Higgs boson is answering an important question. Uh, which is pretty much what philosophy is trying to do, which is uh, also, in some sense, uh, addressing some, some dreams, some, uh, some uh, ideas, some curiosities, also what artists try to do. The so, nature of uh, existence. Yeah, exactly. But so, do you want to talk in Italian and tell, answer the question? Sorry, uh, Fabiola. Uh, what but, did I say? I don't but you, you were just talking to us in English, and the, the, poor, the poor questioner in Bologna will want to hear your answer. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, I, I think they understood, they understood my English, uh, although it's not really perfect, and it's a mixture of English and Italian, so they can... Uh, no, la, la risposta alla domanda... You can look this way and they can still risposta, catch you on the camera. La risposta alla domanda è che, uh, ovviamente, che non, non, non c'è una divisione fra scienze dure, letteratura, arte. Uh, la, la cosa importante è la curiosità, è la curiosità che, è la passione che spingono ciascuno di noi nel campo in cui poi uh, operiamo. Uh, il bosone di Higgs risponde a una domanda molto importante, uh, ma è una domanda di fisica, ma è anche una domanda filosofica, è anche una domanda che l'umanità si pone in generale, quindi, quindi io non, 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 non vedo barriere fra, fra interessi vari, fra arte, uh, fisica, filosofia, letteratura, eh, sono tutti aspetti diversi della intelligenza, della passione della, e dell'anima dell'uomo. Another question from, from uh, Bologna for our collaborators here, Simone? Okay, I've got a question for um, Giochi Candela. Okay, he, he speaks Italian, eh? <laughs> no, no, non in italiano, <laughs> per favore. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. Allora, se quando ci sono stati i primi risultati in, contem in contemporanea tra CMS e Atlas, Just look at the screen. Okay, can we have a quick translation of the question? I, I, oh yeah, you want me to translate? Yes, please, if you, okay. can, if you can manage that. I think he was asking uh, basically uh, when did we have our first results relative to Atlas, who, kind of who was first, uh -huh, when did we uh -huh. first know? Okay. And, uh, See, everyone wants to know that. I think everyone wants to know that, and uh, I don't think we can really be very specific about it because uh, a lot of it is, is hard to say. I mean, you, you have many different channels that were being studied. There were many different studies going on, many things that had to be checked. For me, though, it was, it was in June, without giving a specific date, that I knew we had it. I, I pretty much knew we had it around You mentioned June, June 18th earlier. June 18th was when Plus the data taking stopped, but it was okay. around then I think we started to see after. very clearly that everything was falling in place. Okay, so that's very close to Ju yeah. July the 4th then. Yeah, it was very, very close. Very close to before you made that announcement. Non so se potrei dirlo in italiano. Si deve traduire. You can look this way, by the way, because the cameras are all in front yeah, of you guys, see. so they'll see e us. Una... Fabiola, do you want to translate Joe's answer for, for them? Yeah, you can give well, uh, well, Joe, uh, Joe said, um, said that, of course, uh, there, there's no... In into, in into, it uh, it uh. <laughs> my, my English is not that bad. Scusate. <laughs> 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 Scusate, Joe ha detto che non c'è un momento specifico in cui chiaramente abbiamo 
abbiamo scoperto il bosone di X, è stato un processo che, che, che è durato parecchie settimane, ma verso la fine di giugno abbiamo avuto chiaramente, eh, chiar, chiaramente la, la, la sensazione e la certezza che avevamo qualcosa di veramente importante nelle nostre mani. So we heard from Professor Zoccoli that 500 of the researchers were from Italy. Anyone from Bologna? Ah, in the audience we have someone from Bologna. Do you have a question for the... Uh, come, come, come to the front. There's two. Do you have another question for us, Simone? Yes. Uh, I've heard that uh, the magnets of the LHC uh, are, are very cold, and so it's true. Cool. But uh, can you say that uh, LHC is one of the, of the most coldest uh, places in the universe? Absolutely, yes. The coolest? Yes, indeed. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> Maybe both. <laughs> yes. Coolest and coldest, uh, of course. <laughs> it's one of the coldest. So who's going to take that? Uh, John, you answered, yes, you answered yes, only, yes. But yes. why is it the coldest? Can we have a little bit of the, the background? Well, uh, you need um, to have a vacuum in, uh, in uh, the beam pipe uh, where actually the particles are uh, flowing. Otherwise, you wouldn't have any interactions uh, there. And on top, you need also the magnets, which are superconducting, uh, to be uh, cooled down in order to be uh, actually superconducting, so that you can uh, run these high currents uh, through them and uh, generate the fields uh, which are so powerful to deflect uh, these particles which are so uh, uh, energy uh, um, loaded. Okay, so the magnets wouldn't work otherwise. And I think the whole audience here will agree that the LHC is definitely the coolest place as well, yes. cold yes. or not. Yes. <laughs> well, um, any more questions from Bologna, or are we going to say goodnight to you guys? Okay, well, it's been a pleasure. It's been a pleasure. Short but sweet, as they say. Thank you very much, Simone. Thank you very much, Professor Zoccoli, and your colleagues. So, Paola, are we allowed to ask one more question from the audience to, mm -hmm. to ah, yes, at the back, go for it. Hello, yes. This is directed to both teams, Atlas and CMS. I'm sure that you have accumulated enough data uh, to uh, say conclusively that you have uh, detected a new particle. And I haven't to uh, indicate what that particle is, uh, as far as I understand. To be a boson, it has to have a magnetic spin of an integer value. And to become a Higgs boson, it has to have zero spin uh, to give it uh, the property of matter having mass. Could you explain to me, please, what we mean by zero spin? Nice easy one for you. No, it's, 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 to, to say it has zero spin uh, means that it has no intrinsic angular momentum. And so if we were to decay, if you had many of these particles and you watch them decay, then the, 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 the products would be distributed sort of uniformly. There's no preferred direction in space. If you think of something that's spinning, it has an axis, and so it defines a preferred direction of space. But more importantly, because it's spin zero, it, it's the first time we've ever found a fundamental particle of spin zero. And, and there are many interesting aspects of that as well. I don't know if that's what you're directing me toward or not. So, uh, so the spin is nothing particularly mysterious. It's a, it's a, it's a quantum number. It's a, it's a property of, a, of particles, elementary and non-elementary particles, like you know, for us, the color, of our, the color of our eyes. So each particle has a spin, uh, and uh, the spin values are uh, quantized. So that we can have spin like zero, one half, one, etc. And as Joe was saying. This, this discovery is particularly important because this is the first elementary particle with spin zero. So as our cosmologist, friends cosmologist was saying before, we have also demonstrated that scalar field do exist in nature, which is really a big revolution, also has consequences for cosmology, inflation, and the universe evolution. Can I ask you a really journalistic question? And that is, what does it feel like to be part of such groundbreaking science to do something which the whole world is talking about, you know? This is quite obscure stuff you do. Who's, who's going to go for that? Who's going to answer? Yeah, you're right in front Susan. of me. What do you yeah. reckon? Come on. Here, Give here. me some feelings. You have a microphone? Susan. 
Well, for some of us who have been engaged in this search for over 20 years, uh, it's hard to believe at first because every day you go to work, you're, you're addressing problems, detector, you know, for a long time you design the detector, then you build the detector, you install it, you address problems, then you see the first uh, physics signals in the detector, identify the first particles, so you go along and it's like Joe said and Fabiola said, it's a very long-term process. And all of a sudden, okay, uh, you're, you're in this stage, I mean, you're, you're always doing the same, I mean, going toward the same thing. And when it finally happens, it's a really rare privilege and it's hard to believe because uh, we're really very privileged to, to have been able to take, take part in this, in this uh, discovery because it's not given to every, every researcher by any means. I mean, it's a thing that happens pretty much once in a lifetime if you're lucky. And I think one of your colleagues would like to say something. Okay. Just, uh, Come to the front. It's on. Okay. Uh, is it on? Yes, okay. it's on. It's on. And I think it is that uh, when it happens, you are just in the middle of the, all the work, as, as Fabiola said before that you're working and you're working and you see that there's uh, these things that are starting to come up, there's some indications, but then you are completely swamped with work. But then after a while and you start to, the, the dust start to, starts to settle and then you see that uh, it's, it's there and you were part of it. And uh, for me personally, it was something like really brings hope about a lot of things. It puts a lot of things in, things in perspective because it is such a big effort from a lot of people, and it's not only the LHC and the people that are close uh, here in this area, but also it's coming from the fact that there were governments that uh, helped funding this. There's a lot of people that are supporting this. There's all people that are interested in science. And uh, even the media that is uh, helping to make sure that these things get uh, known and uh, are interesting enough for people to, to get interested and support it, I mean, I really think that it is a very, uh, it goes much beyond the groups that are here. Mm -hmm. I think it is extremely hopeful. It, it brings hope on humanity and on the fact that big dreams can really be made to produce results I for agree. everyone. Well, you are wonderful ambassadors for science. That was great. And we're so hugely privileged to have you here. Thank you very, very much. And we now release you to go on with your speed dating through the evening, because they've been working hard, these guys, chatting to members of the public. Thank you very much. It's lovely. Thank you very much. It's lovely. The half a century long physics hunt to explain how all particles in the universe obtain their mass has reached a historical turning point on July the 4th, when CERN announced to the world the discovery of a new particle. Today is also a special day because we hear two presentations from the two experiments, ATLAS and CMS, on their update on a search for a certain particle. Conclude by saying that we have observed a new, new boson with a mass of 125.3 plus or minus 0.6 GeV at 4.9 standard deviations. So, zooming in this region. Is that it, ladies and gentlemen? We found the Higgs, that big announcement on the 4th of July you saw. We've fated our researchers. Should we just close it all down and give them a good pension and say, tatty bye? I don't think so. The hunt continues. But for what? What are the next big questions? That's what I'm going to ask Julien Lesgourg, um, who is a cosmologist. Involved in Planck, also at CERN? That's right, yes, in Planck. So what is it that's pushing you on? What's motivating you? Well, there are many connections between uh, cosmology and particle physics. And you were asking what is next after the Higgs boson. So first, why did we look at all at the Higgs boson? Because we had very good reasons to believe that it exists. Do we have any reason to believe that other particles exist yet to be found? Yes, we have. And a very good example is 
dark matter. We believe But that, why, why yes. are you so certain that dark matter exists? Because you know, yes. to someone who is not a physicist, it's quite a hard concept. Absolutely. We believe that dark matter exists because we have a lot of evidence from astrophysics and cosmology. And actually, the most robust and precise proof of the existence of dark matter comes from the results of the Planck satellite. Ah, so we've got a little pie chart that's just come up. Yes, I'm going to, to explain this a, a little bit. So, uh, the Planck results uh, can be explained by relying on a model which is extremely sensitive to the relative abundance of dark matter particles and ordinary particles in the universe. So this is this famous cosmic pie, which gives an idea of the composition of the universe today. Actually, this pie, I see, has not been updated after the results of the Planck satellite, but it shows correctly that the universe contains more or less, now we know it's 27 and not 22 percent of dark matter, and of the order of 5 percent of ordinary matter. So this is a very precise measurement of the abundance of dark matter in the universe, but unfortunately, it doesn't tell us much about the nature and the properties of these dark matter particles. So you're pretty certain that dark matter exists? Yes. Which is, which for, is what exactly? Are you going to give us a quick definition of dark matter? For an astrophysicist, it makes no doubt. We have many ways in astrophysics by looking at stellar objects or at the slides that we see with Planck, that dark matter is around there, that there is plenty of it. The difficulty now would be to detect it in order to understand its nature. And dark matter is stuff that has mass but we can't see? Yeah, the problem with detecting dark matter is that it has very weak interactions with other particles. So it's very difficult to create it in the laboratory or to detect the dark matter particles which are just traveling in the cosmos. Okay, so that's a huge another quest. Like yes, trying it's to a find the Higgs quest. boson? It's a big quest. It will be uh, maybe even harder than the Higgs boson or of similar difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's a challenge, yeah. isn't yes, it, for yes, everyone yes, in yes. the room? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Julien, thank we you have, very much. We, we have some hopes. We have some hopes because people have thought of many ways to detect dark matter. Okay. So how do you think we're going to try and find out more about it? Yeah, so for instance, first in the LHC, if we are lucky, we might produce directly dark matter particles. That could be particle, be possible, because particles in the LHC have very high energy. Comparable to the energy of particles in the early universe at a given stage. Okay. So there is a chance that we can create the condition for producing dark matter particles. Okay, that right would be here, the most the obvious way to okay. see them. Yeah. And there are other ways too, aren't there? There are other ways. For instance, you can try to build extremely sensitive detectors that would actually feel when a dark matter particle from the cosmos is passing by. The problem with these detectors is that if you put them in a laboratory, they will see mainly ordinary particles. So the trick is to put them in underground laboratories, very deep underground, then the rock on top of the detector will filter most of the ordinary particle, and on the long term, we might isolate some signal coming specifically from dark matter particles. Okay. Another way comes from the fact that dark matter particles in the cosmos always have a small chance to decay or to annihilate. And then they produce secondary particles, which mix with the cosmic rays propagating in the cosmos. So if we, make, if we build detectors, detectors of cosmic rays, in order to precisely analyze these cosmic rays and put them, for instance, on satellites, then we have a chance to see indirectly this annihilation of dark matter. Okay. And there are other ways. I can mention that, for instance, it's very important for understanding dark matter to look at the morphology and the evolution of galaxies in the universe. Because galaxies, after all, are made up dominantly of dark matter, making up the so-called halo of the galaxies. So by studying the evolution and the morphology of the galaxies, we can also grab some information on the nature of dark matter. For instance, maybe on the typical velocity of these dark matter particles. So what is very nice is that we have thought of very many techniques which are currently being applied, and by putting all this information together, we have a chance to better understand what is really dark matter. You did a brilliant, masterful job in explaining something which I thought you were going to fail flat on your face doing. Thank Julia, you. thank you so thank very you. much.
So that's a big hunt for dark matter to understand more about it. And we're going to take you on the quest of one of these paths that Julia has just described to us. And that takes us out into space to the International Space Station. We're going to catch up with an astronaut on the ISS whose name is Luca Parmitano. And he gave us an interview uh, a short while ago, and we asked him a question. In fact, it wasn't me who asked him the question. It was a young student who's over here. Virginie, are you here? Ah, come on. What did you ask um, Luca Parmitano? What was the question that you wanted Luca Parmitano to answer? Come, take my mic. Nice and clear. You can read it if you prefer. So where is the, uh, where is the ISS? Now do you see us? Do you see Geneva, Europe? And also, what is the purpose of the station? Okay, cool. And how did he answer? Thank you. Hello, CERN. Uh, welcome uh, on board the ISS to all of you following the Origins Live webcast at CERN in Geneva and from the world on the Internet. We are normally orbiting around 400 kilometers uh, above the surface of the Earth, uh, but the altitude varies. It can be 420, it can be 400. Uh, because, of course, uh, there is some resistance up here. We uh, travel around the Earth 16 times a day. Uh, the speed is 28,000 kilometers an hour, or 19,500 miles an hour. You can certainly see uh, the ISS pass over, uh, over Paris, or Geneva, or Bologna, or any other places during the night. It looks like a very bright star, the, probably the brightest in the sky, and uh, it, crosses, uh, it crosses like an arc uh, the sky. Uh, you, you can check on the, on the ESA website to find out when it will be visible above uh, your heads or any, any location in the world, as a matter of fact. As for the last question, uh, the ISS's main purpose is to, to, is to be a unique uh, kind of lab where scientific research can be performed in very special condition, which is uh, weightlessness, or uh, we call it microgravity. Uh, the result of these experiments are then brought back to Earth uh, for the benefit of humankind, uh, for science purposes, for technology development, and for future exploration. Hey, so Luca Parmitano, what, what do you think of his answer to your question? Are you going to be looking out for it? Yes, of course. I was uh, so delighted that he answered my questions. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to track that, that uh, ISS now. He's given you the coordinates and the website details. Virginie, thank you very much. So, you know, the work of the astronauts on the ISS can sometimes, um, they make it look so easy, but it can actually be quite hazardous. And we're going to show you a clip of something that happened on a recent EVA, extravehicular activity, what you or I might call a spacewalk, which went a little wrong. Let's just take a look at what happened and how he reacted. I feel a lot of water on the back of my head, but I don't think it speaks from my back. Are you sweating? Are you working hard? Um, I am sweating, but it feels like a lot of water. I see it now, wiggling. Hi, Chris and Luca. Just for you guys, uh, based on what we heard with Luca saying that uh, water is in his eyes now and it seems to be increasing, uh, we think we're going to terminate EVA case for EV2. So, Luca, we'll have you head back to the airlock. Chris, we'll get a plan for you to uh, clean things up here and then join him here in a minute. Hatch is open, Shane. For, I think, that for a couple of minutes there, um, maybe more than a couple of minutes, I experienced uh, what it's like to be a goldfish in a fishbowl from the point of view of the, of the goldfish. Uh, so. About half an hour into the EVA, 45 minutes maybe, uh, Chris and I were, were ahead on our task, so uh, we were starting our, our third task, and uh, I felt some water on the back of my head, and I realized that uh, it was cold water. It, 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 was a, it was not a normal feeling, so I, I, I told ground. Chris came, came by to, to, give a, to give it a look. He couldn't see anything. He took some pictures of it, but it wasn't until a couple of minutes later that we actually saw the water trickling in the front of the helmet, and then I felt it covering my ears, 
And uh, at that point, we called the terminate for the EVA. I started going back to the airlock, and uh, um, the water kept trickling until it completely covered my eyes and my nose. Um, it was really hard to see. I, I couldn't hear anything. It was really hard to communicate. Uh, I, just, I went back using just, uh, um, uh, just memory, basically going back to the airlock until, until I found it and then uh, went inside and uh, Chris was there in, in, in split seconds to uh, come inside, close the, close the airlock and uh, repressurize. Karen was already there, ready to repressurize. Our Russian colleagues uh, were all there to help and they, as soon as the, uh, as the two compartments were equalized, uh, they doffed, uh, meaning they took off my helmet, uh, wiped my face from all the water, about uh, three, po three pounds of water, I would say, and, uh, and that was the end of it. Well, so uh, he was very cool, wasn't he? An incredibly stressful situation, and he even made light of it, goldfish in a bowl or something. But that was really tough. You know, doing science in space is challenging, sometimes even hazardous. So what's the point of it? Why do we do science in space? Well, we're going to tell you about one particular experiment that's on the ISS called the AMS. <laughs> lots of acronyms, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. And it is one of those cosmic ray detectors that we were hearing about a little a while ago from Julien Lesgourg. Please welcome onto the stage um, Professor Aguilar, who's a senior scientist on the AMS, and Manuela Vecchi. We're going to tell us about what they're trying to do. So lovely to have you with us. Now, an Thank you. But people here might be on speaking terms with the Higgs boson, but they really aren't with the AMS. So tell us a bit about Let's it. Hope it's some kind are. of a detector, huh? Yeah. Well, AMS is, a, for a space standard, is a big detector. It's a big particle detector. For LHC or for accelerator experiment, it's a small thing. AMS weights of the order of 7.5 tons has of the order of 300,000 electronic channels, and that you have to compare with the detectors that were mentioned before by Fabiola and by uh, Joe. They weigh up to 14,000 tons, and they have uh, over 100 million electronic channels. However, being smaller doesn't necessarily mean being more simple. In fact, when you do an experiment to study cosmic rays on the space, you are confronted with an environment that it is extremely hostile. First, you are working in the vacuum, and some of the detector materials behave differently under vacuum conditions than under normal space conditions. There is microgravity that makes some difficulties for the liquids and for the gases of the detectors to move. There is harder radiation, and there are very extreme thermal conditions. In a matter of days, uh, the temperature of the experiment, or the outside part of the experiment, changes from minus 20, minus 30 degrees to plus 50, plus 60 degrees. So we have to design and operate a detector in these very extreme conditions. And moreover, it cannot be repaired. So I cannot send Manuela to change a photomultiplier to repair some things. So things have to be built extremely carefully, over-tested. We do that at showing the accelerators with a high degree of reliability and redundancy. So you've mentioned Manuel. I'm going to ask Manuel, how did you get to be on this project? You know, you're quite a young scientist, I take it. Um, I joined the experiment uh, about two years ago, and uh, it was very good timing because two years ago the experiment was launched in space, so I arrived uh, uh, in a good moment to do research with AMS. At that, previously I was working uh, in another project that is a high energy uh, underwater neutrino telescope, and then my contract as a postdoctor was about to end, so I started to search for a new job as I mean, it's no usual procedure, life for a young researcher. And uh, my field of research is astroparticle physics. So I made uh, some uh, applications to some jobs, and then I got an offer to work for a Taiwanese uh, 
uh, research institution, that is uh, Academia Sinica and National Central University, to work in AMS based wow. on CERN. At wow. CERN. Wow. And so all your dreams came true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so there are opportunities here, guys. Um, answer to your question for your 16-year-old daughter, huh? Um, stay with us. I'm, we're going to show you another clip of the... the, the Oh, we can't, we, can't, we can't show you what we asked, um, what we asked Luca Parmentano, because he goes on his spacewalks, on his EVAs, and one of the things he's doing is monitoring the AMS. Um, l let me ask you, um, um, okay, why don't we get the audience in? Should we do that? What, rather than me hogging the questions, who would like to ask a question to Prof Professor Aguilar about those cosmic rays? How do they try and find dark matter through it? Or to, or to Manuela, if you like. A question at the back, please. Hi. Uh, I'd like to know what kind of resource you have uh, since the machine is in the ISS, because you are looking for these antiparticles, and how are the measurements? Do you know the answer for the, the yes. antimatter? Well, f first, I, I want to stress that the relevance of having a detector on the International Space Station is that you don't feel the effect of the atmosphere. When you study cosmic rays on Earth, that you can do it, and for some very high-energy cosmic rays, the only way to do it is with, with detectors on Earth. But if you want to study the primary cosmic radiation, you better get rid of the atmosphere, because otherwise, what you are studying is the results of the interaction of the primary cosmic rays with the atmosphere that produces even thousands of particles, and from these particles you have to reconstruct the properties of the primary cosmic ray. Some of the properties are impossible to reconstruct by this way, for instance, the electric charge, that it is one of the things that we want really to measure for the cosmic rays, because one of the goals of the experiment is to find primordial cosmic antimatter. We started to take data on May 19, 2011, and since then we have collected and processes here at CERN of the order of 40 billion cosmic rays. With part of this very large statistical sample, we have already studied something which is related with the indirect detection of dark matter particles. As it has been explained by the previous speaker, we all know that there is dark matter, and there is a lot of dark matter. So that is not the question. The question is, what is the nature of this matter, of dark matter? It is made of particles? If so, what kind of particles? Supersymmetric particles or dark matter particles? And as he has already indicated, there are three main avenues to search to figure out what is the nature of that matter. One is to fabricate the particles here at the LHC. The second one is to do, use very sensible detectors underground and see the interaction of dark matter particles with matter. And the third one is through the annihilation of dark matter particles against dark matter antiparticles. Through these annihilation processes, you produce particles like anti-electrons and anti-protons in a different way by the ordinary process of interaction of primary cosmic rays with interstellar matter. So by measuring very precisely the distribution of positrons, of anti-protons, if you find some anomalies, these anomalies can be interpreted in several ways. One of the ways is that they come from particle physics objects like will be dark matter. We have already published a paper in Physical Regulatory Paper in April in which we confirm the existence of this excess of positrons, an anomaly, but the data is still insufficient to decide what of the possible explanations, uh, astrophysical objects or particle physics objects, is the good one. We have to wait, and for that reason, we are going to keep taking data at the rate of, of the other 70 billion per year to collect enough data to clarify this very challenging and important question. Can I ask you a question with, which has a very quick answer, Professor Aguilar and Manuela? It's taken so many years to get the Higgs boson, right? From the moment it was dreamt up by Peter Higgs and other theorists 
in the early 60s to finally capturing it, as we found out last year. How long is it going to take, do you think? Is it a big quest to try and understand dark well, matter? Remember What's what Niels Bohr used to say, that to make predictions about the future is very risky. <laughs> so I'm not going to make a prediction of when we are going to, short. to figure out what is the nature of dark matter. What I believe is with those, all these experimental avenues and a better understanding of some of the th uh, theoretical possibilities, by the end of this decade, we have a, a clear picture of what dark matter is. That's pretty good. End of this decade. Thank you. Um, Manuela, what do you reckon? Now, you've got to say something. You she don't can, just have to can, agree with Professor She Aguilar. can wait longer than me. <laughs> she can wait. <laughs> do we have a question from Twitter? Um, a really good question, actually, in, uh, in an email uh, through from Germany, and uh, someone would like to know, what does uh, AMS tell us about the origins uh, of the universe? Go for it, yeah. So, um, as Professor Aguilar said, uh, AMS, uh, one of the main goals of AMS is the search for primordial cosmic an uh, antimatter. So we detect cosmic rays, and uh, uh, we search for antimatter, and the study of antimatter in cosmic rays can uh, help us to understand the physics of the early universe. Okay. So at the time of the Big Bang, approximately 40 billion years ago, uh, we think that the universe was uh, made of an equal amount of matter and antimatter. However, at our present, uh, the present state of uh, knowledge, of exploration of the universe, so basically so far we have explored uh, a small part of our galaxy, we haven't found an evidence uh, for uh, the existence of antimatter. And for this, uh, AMS is, very, uh, is a unique uh, tool to probe the existence of antimatter in space essentially for uh, a number of reasons. First, because it's a unique long-duration mission. We, mm, we will take data uh, at least until 2020, until the end of the lifetime of the International Space Station. So we can collect uh, seven, uh, several uh, billion uh, events per year, and this is a huge, I mean, important thing, uh, collect data. And then uh, we have a detector that has a, um, a very good, good performances, and this, uh, the quality of our data is also another reason uh, to, to say that AMS is really in a unique position to explore this, uh, this mystery. And M Manuela is a great advertisement for AMS, is she not? Thank you very much. <laughs> and you've <laughs> That, that question from Germany was, it was kind of similar to a question that we put to Luca Parmitano, the astronaut up in, uh, on the ISS, which was, um, how has your perception of our origins changed since you've been on the ISS? Um, and this is what he said. Are we able to get... Uh, to answer the last question, is my, my view of the origins changed? Yes, it has. Uh, it's developed. Uh, when, you know, when I, before I became an astronaut, before I was assigned, before I flew in space, uh, you know, I considered myself uh, uh, just a person from Catania, which is my hometown, uh, a Sicilian and Italian. Uh, but then, uh, being up here, one of the biggest things that I noticed is that uh, uh, lines uh, between, between countries are not visible from, from, from space. They're, they're imaginary lines. Uh, the, the rivers are all small, the mountains are all flat. It's, it's really easy not to see a country from up here. So when I go back and I think about, about origins, I, I, I think that we all originated from the, same, from the same people and then we spread around the world. And I, I wish you know, that everybody could see that coming up, up here and understand that we're all we're all brothers and sisters on, on our beautiful planet and we only have one, one planet uh, and that it's our mother and our origins all lay in there. So um, uh, my view has changed in, in, uh, in the sense that now I feel a lot more close to uh, my fellow citizens of the, of the earth. Uh, that's, that's my planet, that's my, that's my home. Thank you very much 
for your attention and goodbye. Oh. Wasn't that lovely? Thank you very much, Professor Aguilar. Thank, Thank you, you very much Thank to, you to, you. Thank you to, to Manuela. And we move on. So we've been talking about dark matter, which is the next thing, one of the next things. And then what's the next after the next? Huh? That's what we're going to look at now. Let me introduce you to a very important person here at CERN, and that's Sergio Bertolucci, the Director of Research. Sergio, where are you? Please, please come on up. I was confused to say very important person. Not <laughs> <laughs> and Luis Alvarez Gombe, who is a th theoretical physicist. I bow down before you. I have to do this before theoretical physicists. <laughs> we give you full respect. Thank you. So, we're here to ask them, what next? I'm going to start this conversation, okay? <coughs> Hit them with a few questions, and then it's up to you what, where we take this last bit of our program, what you want to ask them. So, let's start with Sergio. The LHC is shut down at the moment, right? Which is yeah. why we're able to go down and meet, um, going for open days tomorrow, etc. What happens when you reopen it? What are the plans? What are you looking for? Well, uh, when we reopen up, first of all, we use it at full blast. It's design energy. As Freddie was telling us before, it's uh, like, uh, it's a big jump. Because uh, up to now, we have used the machine like, let's say, a very nice car, but a normal car. After that, we'll become a very powerful car. Okay, but and you found the Higgs boson, even though you weren't running it at full blast. Well, we were lucky. We were, were lucky and we were smart at the <laughs> both things. Because, you know, uh, research is one of these things which is high-risk type of things. Uh, you know, more or less, you have prejudices where what you want to find, but nature might, might have different views. And nature, at the end, is what counts. So we were very lucky. We, we deserve also a bit of this luck because we were also pretty smart. Uh, having this machine work so beautifully, the experiment, as you have seen, working like, and the computing. So in this moment, around the world, there are, even if we are, uh, if we are in uh, maintenance, there are about more than a quarter of a million of computers working coherently just to analyze data. And so th these three things together, and the brain of uh, thousands of young people made it. But now we want just to help them so, a bit more. But, but, but what should we be looking out for uh, when, when mean, it's at full blast? What, I mean, what might you create? There are so many things we don't understand. You have heard these theories. They have many theories, but we don't understand as fact. Dark matter. But you don't just go hunting Dark for things, energy. do you? you, have to, you you're looking for things, right? Of that's, course. That's your, you, you have a model, you look for it, right? Well, so what are you looking yes, for? Yes, yes and not, because uh, we are looking for models, but we don't want just to model carry uh, away, uh, us away into just be too much uh, folks. We look at nature, we measure things. And the next thing we would like just to see at the LHC is something which is not described by the present theory. Is that, that, that is what we need just to have higher energy, better luminosity, smarter detectors. So this will be important. For instance, if we start fabricating at higher energy, this dark matter is, for instance, dark matter is the, the done by supersymmetric particle, this will be a big thing and will be helpful just to decide among the different models of supersymmetry, which, are, which one is right? Or we could discover exotic things. We could discover large extra dimension of space, which is fantastic. My gosh, it sounds scary. Are you listening, guys? Because you're going to ask him some questions very soon. It's the, the, the realms of the impossible. Are you excited by what Sergio has just been telling us? Are you looking closely at what the LHC is going to come up with of next course, or uh, something else altogether? Well, let me tell you a, a good my, better, my best definition of what is theoretical physics. I think theoretical physics is the part of physics where experiments are very cheap. So, <laughs> <laughs> in a sense, I mean, fortunately, while the machine is not running, we are still running our little accelerators in our brains. 
And there are plenty of questions that remain to be answered now that the election is uh, stopped or even when it turns on. There are so many things that we do not understand that I'm not sure where to start. But for example, there are questions that people have been discussing before on dark matter. Perhaps the dark matter particle will be discovered at CERN, perhaps not. There are questions, for example, why there is matter and no antimatter. This is not such a trivial question because we know that we need to have one proton, say one nucleus of hydrogen, for about every 10 billion photons in the cosmic microwave background radiation to explain what is called nucleosynthesis. You know, why do we have uh, hydrogen, uh, beryllium, helium, and so on? I mean, these are things which are very delicate questions. And perhaps the answer to this will come from the neutrinos. You know, of course, we cannot accelerate neutrinos, so there the LHC will not uh, be leading the search. But other experiments will be leading the search in trying to find some exotic properties of neutrinos, the apparently uh, the weakest interacting particles. And what we are said, you working on? Well, uh, I'm not sure. There are many colleagues here, so I I'm not sure I want to say. <laughs> I fear the competition. Well, what, we are trying to, what I'm trying to do now is try to use precisely cosmology to try to learn by properties of particle physics that could be explored at the LHC, for example. Many of us believe that supersymmetry would be a nice thing to discover. Perhaps nature is not so kind <laughs> and supersymmetry doesn't, doesn't exist or is not accessible to the LHC. What nobody can, can I ask predict you a question? Yes. Um, you know how we started the program saying m many people scoffed about Big Bang. Einstein himself took a lot of convincing. Yes. Supersymmetry, is that in that sort of category now? Do, does half the physicists' world think this is all rubbish or do they all accept it? No, no, supersymmetry is a speculative thing. Okay. I mean, clearly, this is a theory. So okay. this is that I'm saying, you okay. know. Okay. Just, just to get it clear. Okay. No, precisely. That's a very good thing. It's like, for example, even some of the explanations for dark matter objects, not only supersymmetry, there could be also extra dimensions. There could be, you know, the Higgs might not be an elementary particle. It may be composite like an atom, so that there are mm -hmm. extra pieces inside. So there are many possible candidates for these type of things. But the interesting thing is that we do not have any prediction that tells us when and how supersymmetry will break. So sometimes by looking at the sky and looking at these beautiful ripples in the cosmic microwave background, we can perhaps get information of what should be the scale at which supersymmetry breaks and what could be its consequences at, low at, uh, at the LHC energies. So that's what I'm trying to work on, just waiting for Godot that's right, the LHC. Who wants to ask a question to these two gentlemen? Please stand up. Um, would you have any idea of what would be um, the universe um, uh, just before the Big Bang? Well, I wish I knew. <laughs> Do you have any theory about it? Or? There are many theories, but the problem is that these theories, I mean, if it is, even if, if it is difficult to test supersymmetric ideas, to test pre-Big Bang cosmology is even more complicated. There are, I, I, mean, I can tell you, there are many theories. Some of them involve what is called eternal inflation, multiverses, cyclic... Uh, the problem is that most of those theories do not make very precise predictions. So, for the time being, it's just like science fiction. So they're not or testable? They're, they're not, not testable. Easy to, right. Uh, can, do you want to talk to us about one of them, for instance? I like the sound of multiverse. It, sounds, it has a kind of sci-fi ring to it. Well, you know, sometimes uh, it's, it's, there are some interesting ideas, which is the, the fact that, for example, you know, what we call the vacuum or the ground state, we might, which is precisely what is telling us about the Higgs mechanism and the Higgs particle and so on, there are theories where somehow there are many different ground states. It, each ground state can grow a different universe. But the interesting thing is that thanks to quantum mechanics, some of these universes can become hernias in other universes. So all of a sudden we could have a, another universe popping out here, a bubble of another type of universe, a different ground state that will essentially destroy our universe. No worry, it's not painful. <laughs> we won't even notice. <laughs> and then we, this would become a universe, for example, where life is not possible. So you have this kind of a bubbling multiverse or a structure, which is really not just a... You know, it's just the same universe, which is much bigger than we think. And in different parts, you could have completely different forms of the laws of nature. The interesting thing is that by quantum mechanics, you could permeate from some to the other. And then, in a sense, this is like a hydra that will evolve eternally. So we can only do statistics. In that space, for example, we can find what is the probability that there will be Bertolucci. So what is okay, the let's have another question. <laughs> Uh, 
I have a question about um, dark matter. If it's so abundant in the universe, and if it's so important in explaining the structure of galaxies, um, is it in the room with us here now? And if not, why not? It is in the room. It's just, it, it interacts. I mean, there are plenty of neutrinos. I mean, put your hands like this. Do you feel anything? Well, you have one cosmic ray per second going through your hand. Of course, to see it, you need to have a detector that will be able to, to measure it. In this case, it's very easy. Most of them are muons, so it's enough to have something that measures an electric charge. We are also bombarded by neutrinos from the sun, for example. There are billions and billions and billions of neutrinos going through, through this uh, room now. To see them is a bit more difficult. Well, dark matter particle is even more weakly interacting than neutrinos. So this room, the solar system, is full of these dark matter particles, but we just do not have the, the right means so far to, to see them. Sergio? That's why, that's why, for instance, in this case, uh, we have just to either fabricate them and take a picture of it, or otherwise go in a place where we can reduce this background due to the cosmic rays, to the, to the neutrino, just to see this very faint interaction just going underground, or hoping that uh, particle and antiparticle of dark matter, they annihilate in the universe, they are abundant, and then we see it as, with a AMS type experiment as an abundance of, uh, of positron, for instance. Uh, it's a uh, it's, uh, hunt, and the, the, the nice thing is that if you look at the sensitivity, how just we are getting there, every two years, essentially in the last uh, 20 years, we are gaining a factor 10 in sensitivity. This is the, the problem. So we will get it if it's there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to um, say something rather odd. We have somebody who's joining us in this show, which neither of you know about because I've only just heard, and that's Professor George Smoot. No, very good. <laughs> winner of the Nobel Prize. I hope he's still yes. on the line. Who's joining us from somewhere in the US. I'm not quite sure where. Berkeley. Berkeley, maybe, yes. And he was the person who was behind the Kobe project, remember? The very first, that, that, that very first image of the cosmic microwave background radiation that Licia Verde showed us right at the beginning of the program. And we're going to try and see if we can put him, oh, there's his picture, there you are. Hello, Professor Smoot. I don't know if you can hear me. You can hear us. Okay, I'm going to put this mic right next to here. Can you say that again, please, sir? Pleased to be with you. I wish I were at CERN. Fantastic. It, this is very strange technology, but it's kind of working. <laughs> now, oh, can, we ask, can I ask you a question that we've been asking Sergio Bertolucci and also um, Alvar, Luis Alvarez? Thank you, Luis. And that is, what are you working on next? You know, what comes next for you after Kobe and WMAP and all that? It, 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 it's a good time to ask that because we, uh, you know, it was Kobe and the WMAP, and now we're reaching the climax in Planck, and Planck is a great success, but already it's winding down, and I am working on other things, and so we're thinking about continuing on with the cosmic microwave background, although uh, that will be the kind of program I've been working on for years. Another thing that I've been doing is trying to See if we can detect gamma ray bursts, which are the most powerful events that happen in the universe. They, uh, you know, uh, over the lifetime of the sun, it'll put out a, a you know. Professor Smoot, can you just say that again? Because I didn't catch what you just said. Could you repeat it, please? Okay. You're also working on what? Yeah. Uh, right now, we're working on a project to try and detect gamma ray bursts very early and very precisely where they're located. So they can be used as windows and probes to look at the at what happens in the history of the universe when the first structures form and then you have interesting physics and the, and the gamma ray burst itself but the gamma ray bursts are very bright and very powerful and they can illuminate the material in the early universe and tell us about how the first elements formed how quickly and uh, when the first stars formed and just many things about uh, the next stage of the development of the universe Okay, got it. Gamma ray bursts. You know, we're so thrilled that you joined us unexpectedly in this show. Um, do you have a message for us sitting here? Uh, I do have a message. I think it's 
I hope that the audience has the same sense of excitement that I have. It's such a pleasure to see all the scientists get up and talk about their work and see the advances that are being made. And I hope it's inspiring young people to realize a career in science is just a great opportunity. And we're so lucky to be able to be in a time when all these great discoveries are being made. It's been a great privilege having you join us unexpectedly. Thank you so very much for following us and for taking part. Thank you very much, George Smoot. Hi, George. Hi, George. Oh. But that was kind of cool. Hey, what are you doing? <laughs> what are you doing here, I'm John? Tired. I'm just tired of sitting down. I just want to, go for, I want to go for a walk. I'm going to the quantum world. You want to come along? The quantum world? Yes. Uh, do you want to come? <laughs> it's been kind of a heavy evening. What do you think I should say? Um, Be exploring. Uh, I think I'll, uh, next Be time. Be adventurous. All I'm, right. I'm an economist, not a physicist. Okay, so long. Uh, I, are you, it's going to be safe? Yeah, yeah, don't worry, don't worry, no problem. I think you should come. Everybody should come. <laughs> Bye. He's a, theorist, he's, <laughs> he's a theorist. He's cheap, says Louis Salvarez. <laughs> I don't know what we make of that, but thank you very much, guys. <laughs> oh, there he is. <laughs> As if by magic. <laughs> the quantum world. First, I will have a drink at the H bar. Wait, which door is the way in? Oh, I'm in the quantum world now. I must take both doors at the same time. Hi, can I sit here? Please. Great, thank you. <laughs> you must be new here. Uh, yeah, it's a very nice place. <laughs> well, welcome to the quantum world and the H-bar. Yeah, never been here before. Would you like a game of darts? Yeah, um, I'm quite good though. I won the, the French tournament. I am a complete klutz at darts, but I may still win. This is quantum darts, you know? Ooh. How am I supposed to hit the target if it just keeps moving? Quantum fluctuations. The position of the dartboard is uncertain. Hitting or missing the target is just a matter of chance. Hello, can I play too? Who's she? I don't know. She looks like an anti-particle to me. Are they dangerous? Oh, don't worry. There's no danger. Unless its charged conjugate particle is attracted to her. Because in that case... Me too, can I play too? Oh, oh... <gasps> <laughs> oh, look at that poor cat. It's half dead. Half dead? Ah, the cat must belong to Schrodinger. Uh, I'm sorry, I need to go to the toilet. Where's the door to the toilet? Oh, there's no door. You enter through quantum tunneling. You see, according to Heisenberg uncertainty principle, there is a certain probability that I can penetrate through the wall even without the necessary energy to go through. It follows from the equation that says... I'm done. Now we have to wait for me to quantum tunnel through the wall again. Uh, it may be a matter of minutes or hours, even days if I'm not lucky. I hope you're not in a hurry. Good. It happened sooner than I expected. Would you like to come for a drink? Yeah. Oof. I feel like I've been swallowed by a wormhole. I, I definitely want a drink and something strong. Please take a chair. What's the matter with you?
with you? You're so rude! I'm terribly sorry. You see, here in the quantum world, energy is quantized. I applied a single quantum of energy, but it was too much. No, no, please, please don't help me this time. I'm okay. <laughs> Hi, miss. Sit on my stool, will you? Hey, Fermion. I don't care if your spin is up. You gotta follow the Pauli exclusion principle. Only one of you to a stool. So what can I get you? Whiskey. Make a double. And uh, a glass of liquid helium for me. Make it super fluid. But you were a man, and now you're a woman? Man, woman, what's the difference? There are dual concepts in the quantum world, two different manifestations of the same identity. Whew, I only hope I'll be able to keep my identity in this crazy quantum world. My sanity. Would you like ice with your whiskey? Yes, please. What's the matter with the ice? Oh, it's a Heisenberg principle at work again. See, if you constrain something in a small region of space, its velocity becomes very uncertain and it can fluctuate widely. Oh dear. Eternal chaotic inflation must be easier to endure than this. What is this? I asked for whiskey. In the quantum world, you can never be sure of the outcome. Look, I've been more lucky. Liquid helium of the best quality. It's very refreshing, you know. 1.9 degrees Kelvin. Would you like some of mine? No, I've had enough weirdness. I can't make any sense out of it. It is true. Quantum mechanics is totally weird. Even a theoretical physicist like me who spends most of his time thinking about the quantum world has difficulty at grasping its fundamental meaning. We can compute with high accuracy the probability for a quantum process to occur, but do we really understand what's going on? I doubt that the weirdness of quantum mechanics is just a fortuitous freak of nature. It must be a necessary ingredient for making the universe so complex and interesting. Can you imagine a perfectly deterministic clockwork universe where everything is decided by initial conditions? No room for chance. No room for free will. Could evolution take place? Could free-thinking humans exist? The weirdness of quantum mechanics may be the very reason why we are able to think. How weird. I'm feeling your attraction. It's a strong interaction. Thank you to our cast of stars. And um, the twins, who are you? Introduce yourselves. I'm Ikao Murtas, and she's my uh, twin. Greta I'm Greta Murtas, and uh, I'm the antimatter. Okay, yeah. yes, of course. Not me call your antimatter. Sarah, is it? Yeah, Sarah. I'm an intern in the communications department. Oh, well, there you go. Put yeah. to good use. And a great <laughs> budding actress, too. And you, Jan. Jan <laughs> John Judici needs no introduction, of course, but theoretical physicist as you've never seen before, right? And what, 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 what is this that you're wearing over here, these extraordinary skirts? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's a material of the experiment, uh, I think Alash say. It's some kind of experimental LHC material? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's the insulating material of the LHC, Paola tells me in my ear. So. 
and some optical fiber in there too. What do you reckon, ladies and gentlemen? Shall we say a big thank you to our... And uh, if, if we could have the lights down, we could actually see that these ladies ah, are shining. Let's go for it. <laughs> can, we, can we kill the lights? Okay, they tell me they have no access to lights. This is Luminex, <laughs> and it's a shiny dress. So, you know, perhaps later on you can show uh, in some other area, <laughs> darker area, <laughs> the effect of Luminex. So this evening has come to you courtesy of a huge number of researchers here at CERN who have given their time for us to ask them questions and given, given us two or three minutes of their time, yes, which were absolutely packed with gems. Thank you very much to everyone who's made this such a wonderful evening. Thank you. Yeah. There's a technical team behind the scene that's also been beavering very hard for the last few weeks. We've, you heard me mention Paula, who's hiding over there, but I must also say a big thank you to Loic, Guillaume, Jao, Marek, Thomas, Silvano, who's our floor manager, who's rescued me a few times, Ron, Piotr, Arnaud, and of course again, Paula. We couldn't have done it without you.